everybody. So I'm going to read chapter 10 for you and chapter 11 and 12 separately because we didn't finish chapter 10 last week. And then it's going to be uploaded with your questions and discussion. So you need to go in and while you're listening, you can listen to it first and then go back and find questions or you can do it while you're listening to it. All right. Chapter 10. They're going to walk all the way to Trenton, nine miles. I've never been able to walk nine miles in the storm. I'm freezing. Matt curled his half frozen fingers around the musket. He had taken the cartridge box and put the strap over his head, wearing it under his arm as he had seen the other soldiers do. Without his down vest, the wind seemed to cut right through him. His nose had begun to run and wouldn't stop. His toes ached with the cold inside of his sneaker. He thought about turning around and trying to run, but he was afraid that he would be taken for a spy, or worse yet, a coward. Where's Adam Hibbs, he wondered. And what will Katie think when she wakes up without me? I wonder if I'll ever see her or the guys again. I've got to get back to them, but how? His thoughts were suddenly interrupted by Captain McClowey's, McClowey, who had given the cape to one of the generals aside and stopped at a fence row. A group of soldiers were putting down their rails and had begun to build small fires to keep from freezing. And the captain's orders stopped them. There will be no fires, he commanded. The men took the boards and used them to sit on instead. Many of the soldiers slept as they sat upright while some, of, some took to whispering their voices lost in the howling wind. Mitt laid, Matt laid his musket on the ground and began pulling on a board and it wouldn't budge felt embarrassed by his weak attempts to pry the board loose. And finally, a young rebel in rags leaned over and helped him to pull it free. Both he and Matt felt, fell backwards as the board came loose in their hands. They quickly got up and carried the board to a clearing. In silence, they sat down beside one another, hugging their knees to their chest to keep warm. The young soldier couldn't have been more than 14 or 15 years old. Yet there were dark circles under his eyes, giving him a haggard look of exhaustion. His face was blotchy with a rash that seemed to spread up from his neck. There was just about, he was just about to close his eyes when he noticed Matt's footwear. With a quizzical look, he inched closer and touched Matt's sneaker. Matt watched as the long fingernails caked with dirt lightly traced the red letters on his ankle. Three box, Matt whispered. Redcoats? The young rebel quickly removed his hand. No, not redcoats. These are Reeboks. You know, sneakers? Sneakers? The rebel looked wary. Oh, I guess you don't know. They're special shoes made of rubber, Matt whispered, but the soldier didn't seem to understand. He surveyed Matt's sweatshirt and jeans. Where are you from? He asked. This dress is foreign to me and not of any colony I know. Matt remembered from his history report that in the 17... That in 1776, each colony still had a separate style of dress, and you couldn't, you could often tell a New York regiment from a regiment in Virginia rebels simply by the color shirts they wore. He also knew that Nebraska was not yet a colony in 1776. He paused, thinking about his Aunt Shelley and Uncle Mark. Well, I have relatives living in Maryland, he said truthfully. The young rebel nodded, seeming to accept this. My name is Israel Gates. And truth be known, I've never been to Maryland, and I've never seen such queer dress. But queer though it be, I, off, I would offer a trade one of those sneakers. Those sneakers. Sneakers, Matt corrected. Ah, whatever you be calling them, I would give my shirt for one. It's right warm, he whispered, offering a raggedy sleeve for Matt to feel. Why trade your shirt for one shoe? Matt didn't understand until Israel unwrapped his rags that bound his left foot. By the light of the moon, Matt could see the long gash that ran along the side of Israel's foot. It was puffy with infection and crusted with dirt. The whole foot seemed to be turning bluish green. The pain of the wound had stopped. It's all numb. And though I'm glad for that, I'm freezing. I'm afraid it's freezing up on me, Israel told him. Matt bit down on his lower lip at the side of the foot. Quickly untied his sneaker. Israel began to lift his coat over his head. Matt could see that he was nothing more than an old blanket with a slit at the top and some crude stitching along the sides. No, keep your shirt, Matt whispered. I'm warm enough. He took off his sneaker and sock and offered them to Israel. 
What kind of stockings are these? Israel asked, feeling a soft cotton while peering down at the green stripes that went around the top of the sock. Matt couldn't help but smile. Nerd socks, that's what my friend Tony calls them. He wouldn't wear any socks that have stripes. Israel gave a strange look on hearing this and Matt suddenly realized the luxurious life he had left behind where you could, re you, you could refuse to wear a sock just because it had stripes. Israel put his foot in the sneaker in some difficulty, though he did get it in. Matt breathed a sigh of relief. Thanks, Dad, he muttered under his breath, for his mother had always said that he got his big feet from his father's side of the family. Matt suddenly thought of his father and mother, and tears came to his eyes as he wondered if he would ever see them again. What did you say? Israel asked. Oh, I was just thinking about how glad I was for once that I have such big feet for a kid. Matt said, wiping a tear from his cheek. A goat, Israel frowned. No, where I come from, we call boys kids. Like I would be a regular kid and you're older, so you would be a big kid, Matt tried to explain. Israel cocked his head and smiled slowly. Where I come from, they'd be calling you a sight dim for telling a man with a musket that he's an old goat. Matt was about to explain further when he saw that Israel was laughing. I guess it does sound funny, Matt laughed as he quickly undid his other sneaker. He took off one sock and put it on his left foot and then replaced the sneaker on his right foot. Matt knew that he would have to keep both feet covered to keep them from freezing. He knew it wouldn't be long before his socks became wet from stepping in ice and snow, and he wondered if he would have to, the courage that Israel had to keep going. Israel saw that worried look on his face and silently leaned over and began to wrap Matt's left foot in the dirty linen strips that had once been around his own foot. When we was through, both, when he was through, both boys stretched out their legs and grinned. I don't know your name, Israel whispered, reaching into his haversack. Matt, uh, Matthew Carlton, Matt said shyly. Well, Matthew Carlton, you've been a good friend to me and I'll not forget it. Here. Have some of this, he said, offering Matt what looked like a burnt piece of meat. Matt was starving and gratefully accepted the gift. Um, it's, it's good. What is it? He asked with a mouthful. Pigeon, Israel replied. I trapped one a few days ago before we crossed the river. I'm glad I had enough time to roast him. Pigeon? I'm eating pigeon, Matt thought with a grimace. Israel reached down and took up a handful of snow in his mouth. With that... Uh, sorry, would that we call a small beer to wash it down with? Now there would be a feast. Um, a real feast, Matt said bluntly. Would that we had a Coke and a hamburger with a side of fries? Now that would be a feast, Matt thought to himself as he brought some snow to his mouth. It wouldn't be long before I'll be eating regular meals again. And if we live through the next six days, I shall return your gift in kind, Israel told him, trying to warm his hands with his breath. My enlistment comes due the first of the year, and with my wages, I can pay for the nerd stocking and shoot. Don't worry about it, Matt whispered. But what will you do when your enlistment is up? Will you sign up again or stay and fight? Israel closed his eyes and shook his head wearily. This regiment is the 12th of Massachusetts, and I don't know that many of us could re-enlist even if we wanted to. We barely got out of Montreal alive, and with the Indians and then the pox, the march to Albany killed off most of our wounded and sick, and this last march to Pennsylvania took still more. Those of us left have barely enough strength to lift our muskets and tell me what good these, <laughs> sorry, and tell me what good will these be, he said, reaching for his gun. They're soaked after all this rain and snow, and will surely be a miracle to get them firing. At least you have a bayonet, he pointed at Matt's musket. Oh, I know there are those that are in high spirits because we seem to be on the fence at last. But I'll wager you won't find much cheer here. I've seen so much hardship that you could make me a general and I wouldn't re-enlist. No, he sighed. I've had enough of army life. All I want now is to go back to Massachusetts and a warm bed and a slice of hunter's pie. And besides... I've got to deliver these. He pulled out a small leather pouch from his pack and a dozen glass beads fell into his outstretched palm. 
Aren't they fine, he whispered, at the light of the moon bounced off the delicate painted glass. They'll make one pretty necklace, he smiled. They are pretty, Matt agreed. Who do you have to deliver them to? To one very demanding lady. Israel's blue eyes seemed to twinkle as he said this. Oh, Matt mumbled like a girlfriend. Girlfriend? No. Well, yes, yeah, she's a girl and surely a friend and also the fairest maiden in Massachusetts. She's got a mop of golden curls in the face of an angel. And though truth be telling, she's a devil of a temper. And when she's vexed with you, she'll stamp her feet and shake her little fists. She's something to contend with, I'll guarantee. Matt moved closer to Israel. He wasn't much interested in hearing about girlfriends, but he was glad for the company, no matter what they talked about. Maybe, he thought to himself, with Israel for a friend, I'll be able to get through this march. A chilling wind swept over the clearing and Matt hugged his knees even closer to his chest. What's your girlfriend's name? Matt said with a shiver. Israel smiled. Abby, but I call her my Gabby Abby, he laughed. Not five years old and she can out talk a tinker on a Monday. Five years old? Matt looked perplexed. Hey, she's my little sister. Israel smiled, wiping his nose with his sleeve. My mother died in birthing her, and since I was the eldest, I promised my mom that I would watch over the little ones. My father had a likeness for the rum, you see. He spent most of his days in the tavern, and then who's looking after Abby now? Matt asked. My brothers, Israel told him. Ben is 12 years, Simon is 11, and Nathan's is 8. We're good boys, but surely I hated to leave them alone. Israel's voice trailed off as he gazed up into the moon. It must have been hard for you to choose, Matt whispered. Choose? Israel's eyeballs shot up. You know, choose between your family and your country. It's a soldier. It's what a soldier has to do, I guess. Make his country safe for his family, right? Israel shook his head and gave a low, sarcastic laugh. His voice seemed a husky whisper. I don't know about you, but I thought these colonies were safe enough without a war. I had no desire to be a soldier. And I wouldn't be here now if my father hadn't drank up what little coin he managed to bring home from his tailoring. I had to keep my promise to my mother, so it would be up to me to see if we didn't starve. I sold the only thing I could, and come December 31st, my debt is paid. I don't understand, Matt whispered. Israel studied his young friend's face. You remind me of my brother Simon, bright eyes and thick head, he sighed. I sold myself as a substitute for a wealthy silversmith in Boston. I took his enlistment papers in return for a cow and enough coin to keep my sister and brothers fed till spring. I only planned to stay till the enlistment was up, but when I found myself marching on foot to Montreal with all a party of Indians fast on our heels, I decided to re-enlist so I could get home under the Army's protection. Besides, they were paying me $6 a month. Now I have just six more days to go and I can head home. He closed his eyes and smiled. And then he opened his hand and looked down at the beads again. I promised Abby a present. And so when we came across a tinker on the road of Albany, I asked to see his wares. A tinker is like a street side salesman. Okay. Blue is her favorite color, he said, turning the beads over in his hand. They come from France, you know. Tinker told me so, he grinned. My lieutenant was right vexed with me for spending my last pistarines on pretties. He scolded me for not buying some leather that I could make up into some decent shoes. But I promised Abby I'd bring her back the prettiest present I could find and it was my last bit of coin. Many a tinker and shopkeeper won't take the paper we paid for paid. They don't believe in continental currency is worth anything. So they made up their own money called continental currency and the and some people won't take it. So they have like different forms of money. But then, but then you must know that. Though in truth, you don't know, look old enough to count your wages, must let, much less earn them. How did you come to enlist? Um, that squirm trying not to look at Israel. The truth is I didn't enlist and you're right. I'm not old enough. It was an accident. You see, I got separated from my friends and sister. I have a little sister too. Her name is Katie. Anyways, I was sleeping at a friend's house and I thought we could have an adventure. So he went on this walk after my friend's parents went to sleep. And then his voice was beginning to crack and he tried to hold back tears. 
I don't know how this happened and how we ended up here. I never knew it would be like this. I'm not from here, Israel. You have to believe me. I'm from another... It's all right, Israel interrupted him, leaning over and putting his arm around him. I'll look after you. We're two goats. We'll get through this together. You'll see. And when my enlistment is up, we'll find your sister Katie and you, and she can come and visit me and Abby and the boys. Don't worry, Matthew Carlton. You've got a friend in Israel Gates. You can depend on it. All right, that was chapter 10. So make sure you do the questions and re-listen to it because that was a lot of little details in there.